So a week and a day ago, something awful happened in my country, um, which everybody knows. There was a bomb at the MEN arena in Manchester. 22 people, a lot of them kids, got killed. Uh, and Manchester is a city I have lived in before. When I lived in the UK, I used to go there a lot. I was there just last October. I have lots of friends there. And what was funny was... I found out about it on the Monday night just after it happened and I was kind of just on the internet like trying to scour, trying to find any information I could, but not really feeling much. And then the next day I was visiting one of my best friends at work and he knows that I, like, I get very affected by, by lots of things that happen in the news. And he was like, you seem fine. And I said, I know. And he'd said, I would have thought you would be more affected by this because you know Manchester so well and because you're like more likely to have gone to a pop concert than you are, you know, a gay nightclub or a Yemeni funeral or other things that I've been sad about. And I was like, I know. And I guess it's just one of those things where after a while there's so many bombs that you just start to get used to it. Um, and that was on Tuesday. And then on Wednesday morning, I was emailing with a friend of mine who's working in Manchester and something shifted in my brain and I just crumbled. And I realized that all of my being fine was just a coping mechanism up until then. And I just, I was by myself in my apartment and I just collapsed and was lying on the floor of my bathroom just sobbing. And eventually I got the strength up to text this friend and just say, I'm drowning, you have to come, I'm drowning. And so he came after work and he scooped me up and, and we sat on my couch. I was lying there with my arms around him, just sobbing into him and saying, I just feel so much despair, like everything. You know, I think about the kids in my life and I can't feel happy because there are people whose kids aren't coming home. And I think about anything else and what's happening in the US and what's happening in the UK with the politics. And it just feels like everything is so fucked. Like there's nothing. I said, I feel like I just want to do like a Hitler's bunker and just get cyanide pills and just feed them to everyone I love and myself. And he said, calling it a Hitler's bunker, you're not really selling it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I stayed with him and his son that night and I, and I spoke to friends the next day and eventually I got to the point where I could get my head above water and where it was, where it is now, where I'm sure it is for a lot of you, where you know I'm able to function and when I think about it, it's just a dull thud of sadness in the bottom of my stomach instead of this all-consuming despair. But even when I was right in the grip of it, there was one thing that I was clinging to in my mind and with my heart and it was this story that was going around the internet on Tuesday and Wednesday. You may have heard it. They read it out in the CBC. And it's actually a friend of mine, a guy called Mark Haynes, who I used to work with at a radio station in London, in XFM. And I want to read you the story. Um, and then I want to tell you why I was clinging to it. So... Um, on Tuesday, when all the news came out about the bomb, the news came out also that Roger Moore had died. And if you don't know Roger Moore was um, the James Bond. And he was the James Bond when I was a kid and when Mark, my friend who wrote the story, was a kid. So Mark had posted this on Facebook. Um, As a seven-year-old in about 1983, in the days before there were first-class lounges, I was with my granddad in Nice Airport when I saw Roger Moore sitting at the departure gate reading a paper. I told my granddad I'd just seen James Bond and asked if we could go over so I could get his autograph. My granddad had no idea who James Bond or Roger Moore were, so we walked over and he popped me in front of Roger Moore with the words, my grandson says you're famous, can you sign this? <laughs> as charming as you'd expect, Roger asks my name and duly signs the back of my plane ticket, a fulsome note full of best wishes. I'm ecstatic, but as we head back to our seats, I glance down at the signature. It's hard to decipher, but it definitely doesn't say James Bond. <laughs> My granddad looks at it, half figures it out, and it says Roger's, sorry, half figures out that it says Roger Moore. I have absolutely no idea who that is, and my heart sinks. I tell my granddad that he's signed it wrong, that he's put someone else's name. So my granddad he heads back to Roger Moore, holding the ticket, which he's only just signed. I remember staying by our seats and my granddad saying, he says you've signed the wrong name. He says your name is James Bond. <laughs> Roger Moore's face crinkled up with realization and he beckoned me over. When I was by his knee, he leant over, looked from side to side, 
raised an eyebrow and in a hushed voice said to me, I have to sign my name as Roger Moore because otherwise Blofeld might find out I was here. <laughs> he asked me not to tell anyone that I'd just seen James Bond and he thanked me for keeping his secret. I went back to our seats, my nerves absolutely jangling with delight. <laughs> my granddad asked me if he'd signed James Bond. No, I said, I'd got it wrong. I was working with James Bond now. Many, many years later, I was working as a scriptwriter on a recording that involved UNICEF, and Roger Moore was doing a piece to camera as an ambassador. He was completely lovely, and while the cameraman was setting up, I told him in passing the story of when I met him in Nice Airport. He was happy to hear it, and he had a chuckle and said, well, I don't remember, but I'm glad you got to meet James Bond, so that was lovely. And then he did something brilliant. After the filming, he walked past me in the corridor, heading out to his car, but as he got level, he paused, looked both ways, raised an eyebrow, and in a hushed voice said, of course I remember our meeting in Nice. <laughs> but I didn't say anything in there, because those cameramen, any one of them could be working for Blofeld. <laughs> I was as delighted at 30 as I had been at seven. What a man, what a tremendous man. <laughs> yes, clap and I'll pass it. And the reason I was clinging to that story in the despair is because the way that that story made me feel Everything that happened in Manchester, everything that's happening in the US and the UK, it can't take that away. Those moments of humanity, like the way that we feel when we hear the stories tonight. And that's why I do this show. And that's why I help people tell stories. And that's why, and I feel like that's where we find, that's where we combat this, right? That's where we find the empathy. I mean, your brain is literally acting like you're inside the story. And so that's how we can fight this kind of thing is so keep telling stories whatever you're doing like just keep telling stories and keep coming and listening to stories okay we're going to take a quick break <laughs>